Well, good evening and welcome to our Good Friday service. Uh, the church calendar sets aside traditionally 40 days to prepare our hearts for the cross on Good Friday and the resurrection on Easter Sunday. And it's just a reminder to us that our entire lives are framed by this divine intervention in love. I was reading a book recently that asked the question, is it possible to know the world and to still love it? In other words, is it possible to really see things as they actually are? To take an honest, unvarnished look at the evil and pain and brokenness in our world and that actually lives inside of each of us and still move towards the world in love? And the answer to that from Good Friday is yes. Jesus Christ, for seeing the shame, for seeing the injustice, for seeing all the God forsakenness, still chose to carry the cross in love. And this is why we call Good Friday good, because if God can really know the world and still love it, then so can we. And so I just want to encourage you to set aside this time, switch off your phone, remove any distractions, and just listen to these final seven words of Christ. They speak of incredible pain and incredible love. When they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him, along with two criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the beginning, Adam and Eve enjoyed life in the garden with God, life as it was created to be. They were naked and felt no shame. Shame did not enter human experience until Adam and Eve chose to turn away from God. Right away, they recognized their nakedness and hid from God. They were shamed and afraid. Ever since that day, we have known the shame that our sin brings with it. The physical pain of crucifixion was intense and horrific. But perhaps even more unbearable was the public humiliation this type of execution brought. Jesus was stripped down, mocked, struck, spat upon, sneered at, and insulted. He was subjected to the worst of what lies in the hearts of people. The only one truly worthy of praise suffered the most humiliating and shameful form of torture possible. Why? The shame that Jesus endured on the cross was the shame of our sin. He stood in our place at great cost to himself. Jesus endured the cross and scorned its shame. He thought nothing of the shame the Romans and the bystanders tried to heap upon him. He did not defend himself or cry out against the injustice he was enduring. But he did cry out not for himself, but for us, for the very people who were crucifying him. His first words from the cross are a prayer asking his father to forgive the very people who were torturing him. And the fate of every person who ever lived hangs in the balance, depending completely on the answer to Jesus' prayer. Jesus, hanging in pain on a piece of wood, could so understandably have asked for justice, but he chose mercy. Can anyone ever wonder again if God is willing to forgive our sin? Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole. For the things we've done and left undone For the ways we've wandered from your heart Forgive idol 
The second word, Luke 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It has been easy in the past year for me to be frustrated with God for the pain and injustice and violence I see at work in the world. And 
at the indifference that some within the Christian church have shown towards that pain. Despite my head knowledge that Jesus will one day come and heal all things, my heart easily becomes cynical, and my anxious grumble can often echo the first criminal next to Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us while you're at it. Unfair suffering makes me angry, and I don't think that's wrong. Yet when that anger towards injustice becomes a cynical lack of trust in God, I'm forgetting someone crucial. I'm forgetting the innocent man upon the tree. This man has done nothing wrong. Jesus knows what unfair suffering looks like more than we do because he went through it. And even though I so often cultivate a heart of bitterness or cynical apathy, even though I forget that Christ himself underwent injustice in order to defeat it, and even though I forget him, I forget Jesus himself, that innocent man on the tree, he remembers me. Jesus remembers me. And when I remember that, that Jesus has promised me a role in his kingdom, it can turn my cynical apathy into gratitude and a desire to participate in the healing of our world of unfair suffering with hope instead of despair. Now, I have several people in my life who I love, who I disagree with on important issues of justice. And my ingrained tendency is to judge them and criticize what I see as uninformed apathy, all the while sitting in my own cynical apathy, not doing much at all to care for the people I claim to care about. But then I remember Jesus, the man who suffered and died for the abandoned and neglected least of these, but also who suffered and died for the self-righteous religious person that frustrates me. And I remember that he also died for me, an equally messed up, self-centered, self-righteous human being. And by the grace of God, there have been times this year where I have looked to the innocent man upon the tree. And it is then and only then that I have lovingly engaged with our world's suffering people and yes, engaged lovingly those church people that are hard for me to get along with. May we all remember Jesus as he first remembered us. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole.
The third word, John 19, 25 to 27. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. Even as a mother myself, I can't imagine what it must have felt like to watch all that Jesus endured in his journey to the cross, unable to rescue him or change his course. While others hurled insults, Scripture does not record any words from Mary. Having experienced personal loss myself, I would surmise she was too stricken by grief and sorrow to have spoken. Did she know in some way that this was his destiny? Did God give her a peek into his glory to ease her pain and affliction? This we do not know. Not many of us have lost a child, and certainly not to the public humiliation, beating, and mocking that Jesus experienced. So how could we possibly know how Mary must have felt? Watching it all unfold, unable as a woman to have a voice, powerless to stop it from happening. Watching both her son and her savior be taken away from her. Surely Jesus felt her sorrow. Surely he knew. This must have added another layer of complexity to the heavy burden he already carried. The burden of grief and separation. Separation from his heavenly father separation from his earthly mother. Isn't this the way Jesus works, even now in our lives? He carried our burdens then. He carries our burdens now. He knew what Mary would need and gave her John to be her son. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole.
the fourth word, Mark 15, 33 to 34. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I love this image of the Trinity, the Son poised to give his life according to his Father's will, done in the power of the Spirit. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22, which includes, God, why are you so far from my cries of anguish? This is incredibly meaningful to me as I realize that Jesus' obedience means there period, there's a period of time where the Father is far from his cries, and the result is powerful. Unlike Jesus, I don't always follow God's will. But because of Jesus giving his life, I am a child of God. Even though apart from Christ, I'm not righteous. My loves are disordered, meaning there are times I allow my comfort or reputation or other things to creep above my love for God. But in Jesus, I'm righteous. And a specific result of this time where Jesus references the Father being far during his cries of anguish is that I'm able to call out to God with my own cries of sorrow. This impacts my life in realizing God is with me always, certainly including during painful chapters in my life. I remember enduring a hard season with someone who I thought was my friend, reflecting on Jesus asking why God was so far off in his anguish was incredibly meaningful as I realized I could go directly to God in my own deep pain. This enabled me to bring my pain to God and cry out to him. Jesus has perfect fellowship with the Father, but before I believed in Christ, I was far from God. Then, after placing my faith in Jesus' finished work, I am no longer far from God. I am his daughter. And another contrast is this moment where Jesus is quoting the psalmist, God, why are you so far from my cries of anguish? It should be my cries, not Jesus' cries, which are far from the Father. But this is another exchange another precious result of becoming God's daughter. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole.
The fifth word, John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I thirst. There is a kind of timelessness about hanging on a cross. It's not a quiet death. It's not over in an instant. It is not a glorious moment of martyrdom. A cross is as much an instrument of torture as it is a gallows from which to hang. As the day wears on, seconds stretch into minutes, which stretch into hours, until there comes a point when time can no longer be measured except in the gradual weakening of the body and its ever more insistent demand for that substance which is so vital to life, so foundational to all living things, so basic to existence as we know it, water. Water to moisten a parched mouth, water to free a swollen tongue, water to open a rasping throat that cannot grasp enough air, water to keep life alive just a few minutes longer, water to keep hope alive, water to a crucified man is life. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. A thirst for water is a thirst for life, and a thirst for life is a thirst for God, who promises streams in the desert, mighty rivers in the dry land, and living water springing up to eternal life. Here, at the end of it all, those promises seem far away, distant. And yet Jesus, forsaken by God, clings to the hope of life. Knowing that everything had been fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole. One by one, my accusers walked away. 
sixth word, John 19 verses 29 and 30. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is difficult for me to look at a piece of work and declare, it is finished. In part, because I'm somewhat of a perfectionist, I can always see something that could be improved, a paragraph that could be rewritten, a word that's not quite right. This is evident if you take a look at the documents folder on my laptop, where there are many things entitled something like final, final, revised, version two. I'm sure some of you can relate. But perfectionist tendencies aside, it is still rare to be able to look at my work and say, it is accomplished. For me, this is often because I envision far more than I can actually achieve in a given time period, whether that's a research project or spring cleaning the house. And I don't think I'm alone. The reality is that in this fallen world, incompleteness and imperfection will run through even my best efforts. I want to make a difference for my work to have lasting impact. Yet time and time again, I am met with resistance from my environment and faced with my own limitations. And in trying to get to the bottom of my mental to-do list, taking time to rest can sometimes seem like an elusive goal. This is why these last words of Jesus are so hope-filled for me. On the cross, Jesus declares, it is finished. In this, he proclaims that all the work the Father had sent him to accomplish was now complete. He had finished what the law and justice demanded, bearing the penalty for the sins of the whole world, triumphing over death, securing our eternal salvation, and restoring our broken relationship with God. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, After making purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The fact that Jesus sits down indicates that his work of salvation is complete, and Jesus calls us to take hold of and rest in this finished work. Part of my anxiety about going back to work after our baby Finn was born was wondering how on earth will I get everything done? The answer that comes from these three words of Jesus is, I don't need to. On the cross, Jesus deals with our most fundamental need for forgiveness. So instead of focusing on myself and my imperfect work and incomplete obedience and love for others, 
I can fix my eyes on the finished work of Jesus, knowing that God looks at me and sees the righteousness of Christ. Reminding myself of this truth, that there is nothing I can add to Jesus' perfect sacrifice on my behalf, gives me freedom to do the work he has called me to with joy and satisfaction, instead of out of anxiety and frustration. And knowing that my greatest burden has been lifted also enables me to rest, even when my to-do list remains undone. Because only Jesus can look at his work and affirm in truth, it is finished. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole. The seventh word, Luke 23, 46. There was darkness over the whole land while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple 
was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is the end, the very end, the end of the ordeal, the end of the suffering. And Jesus, alone on the cross, tortured, exhausted, abandoned by his friends, forsaken by God, grasps for a last breath and gathers the strength for one final cry. Why would he choose to speak so close to the end? Why would he muster the last energy he had to cry out with a loud voice? Couldn't God have heard his thoughts? Unless God wasn't the only one intended to hear. Unless his voice was pitched loud so that we too might hear this final dedication of his soul. A dedication made despite the pain, despite the mocking, despite the agony, despite the sense of horrible aloneness he felt. A dedication made to God before the resurrection, before the victory of the kingdom, before any assurance other than that which faith could bring. Jesus entrusts his spirit, his life, and all that has given it meaning to God in faith. Even at the point of his own abandonment, when the good seems so very far away, he proclaims his faith in God. The darkness cannot overcome it. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made whole.
This is a reading from Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us is turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Going into Lent, a group of us reflected you know, that one of the most challenging things about observing Lent this year is our lack of proximity to each other. You know, in the Christian community, we are meant to lament together. But together right now is actually one of our biggest losses. It's something we've set aside to keep each other safe. Now, Becca Steele and I tried to envision a way that we could recapture corporate lament in the prayer stations that have stood at church over the last six weeks. You know, many of you participated by stopping by and adding your losses to a large canvas. You know, I'd encourage you now to not so much reflect on your own losses as we did on Ash Wednesday, but instead um, to reflect on those of others. Becca's going to transform our losses into a piece of artwork, which uh, intends to communicate the ways that God actually shares in our pain as Jesus carried it, bearing it even to death itself.